Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Sandy. Welcome to the show, Sandy. Thank you, Thank for you so time. much for having me. Yeah. Could you introduce yourself to the listeners, please? Absolutely. My name is Sandy Pricer. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Rise Up Cooperative, and I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee in USA. And how do you pronounce that again? My name or no, no, the, the, the place Ch- Chattanooga, Tennessee. Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yeah. My southern accent might be coming out when I say that. <laughs> well, I, I was pretty sure it was pronounced Chattanooga. Um, because we all heard, we've all heard the song about the chat Chattanooga. Absolutely, the choo choo. Uh, the Chattanooga, <laughs> yeah. And also, as I think when we spoke last, I told you about uh, a good friend of mine that I had many years ago. Uh, so I was at a language school in in uh, Cologne in Germany, and the uh, we so we all lodged with different um, families, and in the next room to uh, to, to to my room was a a lady called uh, Ellen from Chattanooga, <laughs> Tennessee, and specifically Lookout Mountain, awesome. which is a kind of it's it's that like that's a village that's near. Chattanooga is it on the kind of like um, town Chattanooga is kind of in a valley surrounded by mountains and look out as one of the mountains that surrounds Chattanooga Valley mm-hmm. okay so um you're a CEO you're also the mum of six yeah yes yeah okay um so uh the rise up cooperative what what's that about so Bringing life and leadership workshops to teens and at-risk youth is what we do. Um, We do that by bringing volunteers from within the community, the the country, the world, um, to bring them these special skills. I I think they're vital skills. And they bring their time and their talent, their expertise to bring them to the teens to help them have better, more productive futures. Fantastic. And uh, I've had the honor of doing a little video and audio f- for you on this, which I really, really enjoyed doing that. Thank so you. when you hear this phrase, thriving adoptees, what, mm-hmm. does that, what does that mean to you, Sandy? What I think when you say that is really what I try to encompass in what we do with the workshops is helping a helping you thrive in your adulthood, be productive, be empowered, be um, strong and independent. And when I have three of my six children were adopted and when I envisioned them being adults, I envisioned them being thriving adoptees in their life to kind of be their own person and overcome whatever obstacles has brought them um, that had brought them to be adopted in the first place. Yeah. So, um, wow, there's a lot there. (laughs) There's a lot there. Be their own person. Uh, Yeah. How old are how do your kids? I, I I don't want to pry, you know, but if you hey, you're if, fine. If, if if I'm if I'm out of order, you know, I ask two questions kind of question. Roughly how old are they? Because um the, the three adopted or all six? All, all of them, yeah. Okay. Um the three adopted today are 15, one will be 13 on Wednesday, and right. nine. Right. And my three biological are 17, 15, and 13. Wow, okay. So yeah, you have got definitely got your, <laughs> your hands. <laughs> You got your hands full. So um, let's take. Uh, well, what what's the most what's the most important out of what you said? So you said productive, um, empowered, strong, be their own, um, be their own per, uh, be their own person. And I think you also said, said uh, overcoming obstacles if um, mm-hmm. that life throws at them. If I if I got those all down when I was write, writing the notes. So what, what would you say is the most important one? Or is there the most important one out of that? I'm not sure that there is, because I really feel like they kind of build off each other. They really um, complement each other. 
Uh, Rise Up stands for, it's an acronym for responsible, independent, strong, empowered, upstanding, and productive. And I really feel that those characteristics in anybody, regardless of your past or um, what you've been through, are so very important. I was going to say super important, and my kids make fun of me when I say that word, but they're very important to be able to be successful and success I know looks differently for everybody. So whatever your success looks like, I think it's vitally important for you to have those characteristics. Yeah. So big question, right? It's just a jumping off point, right? I'm not expecting you to answer it. So, so what do you think helps that happen? <laughs> a lot of things, huh? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is just a jumping examples. off point. <laughs> yeah. Examples in your life and mentors and attitude, so much, so much. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so one of the things that I'm uh, that I'm just thinking of that came to my mind as you said that. Um, so you said uh, uh, attitude, and you said mentors and examples. I had a conversation with somebody, a, a psychologist in the adoption space, and we got onto the subject of because you know, some people it's pretty scary it's a pretty scary this for me this was pretty scary when when i found about when i found this so people some people were um equating adoption trauma like relinquishment trauma with ptsd which i found pretty pretty scary okay um and i said so um i said to this I said to this, uh, this psychologist, so what's the, so let's focus in on the PTSD stuff because it's more evidenced. There's a lot more research, obviously, in this, and a lot of it comes out of the States, a lot of it comes out of, um, out of the military, starting with Vietnam and, all, and, and to the Gulf War and all this stuff. I said, I said to the, uh, uh, I said to the psychologist, so what's the difference that makes the difference? Oh, sorry. The first thing was, um, I don't know if you've if you've heard this or, or not. Uh, if not, just take a guess. So, how what percentage of people that go through traumatic stress events do you think get PTSD? I believe that women percentage is higher, but I believe it's seventy five to eighty percent. So. The stats I saw mm -hmm. were 10 to 20 percent of people that go through traumatic stress get PTSD. So 80 so to much better than what I thought. <laughs> yeah. So 80, 90 percent don't. Right. OK. So, so I asked this psychiatrist. So what's the difference that made the difference? And she reeled off a whole load of things. Right? She reeled off a whole load of things. And, and I said, yeah. Um, so all those ones that you're talking about here. All those things that you're talking about, you're talking about external things. She's talking about external. So obviously, we're talking about adults. She's talking about external things. So the support that they got after the event, essentially. I said, okay. "What? What about the internal stuff?" And she knew nothing. She 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 couldn't she couldn't answer that question. And when I asked you what makes it happen, you said um, examples and the models. But you also said attitude, mm -hmm. so you'd enca you'd encapsulated the external and the internal, internal. and yeah. the internal stuff, right? So I'm going to get to a question, uh, and you're thinking you're probably thinking when's he going to get to the question? <laughs> um, so you said attitude, the internal stuff. So what is it that, oh, what, what is it, what, what helps kids have that, develop that internal um, perspective, that internal driver, that, that word that you sum up as attitude? What, what do you think helps kids, adopted kids, develop the attitude or have the attitude to thrive? I think that in some people, it's a personality and you just already look for the bright side, look for the silver lining, 
automatically have that, <clears throat> excuse me, attitude and that mindset to look at the good things and to get over, get over, get, get overcome things. But though for those that don't have that automatic natural instinct, it definitely needs to be taught to them to an example be set for them, mentors or teachers or somebody in their lives that can model that attitude and overcoming and mindset behavior so that they can learn it and interject it into their own life and their own habits to in order to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I love that because you brought it back around, haven't you? Because you said the examples and the insight, and then you said, I said, what happened? And so, and so you said, in, you said internal attitude, external examples, and then the, so the external examples become the building blocks for the developing of the attitude within the kid themselves. Absolutely. So obviously th this is, kind of a core of of, of the program here um, of what you're doing at the rise up um, uh, cooperative this is at the core of what you're doing this is a, a, an involved an involved process it's not something that you know it's something that we're just talking about mm -hmm. in in, in a, for the next half hour or so um we're not in a fully blown uh intervention classroom session workshop whatever you call it. you you call them workshops don't you workshops yes you call them mm -hmm. workshops, sorry you call them workshops so um what so a, a, a conversation doesn't afford us the same opportunity as a as a workshop but what right. can you share uh for the for the for the adoptive parents who are listening that gives them a flavor of this that you deliver through your workshops um can i can i explain a couple of the workshops and why i feel that they're helpful to, uh, to answer yeah, that but, question but, uh, yeah of course yeah um i, I guess I, I i'm what i'm trying to get at is kind of educational content rather than promotional content do you see what right. I mean? yeah so like stuff that people can get their heads around and think yeah i can apply that so but yeah go for it Whatever you think best. I was just thinking about um, like grief and how you you mentioned PTSD and so many times PTSD and grief can go hand in hand, and so we've had a I, I think he's a therapist, a counselor, come on and talk to the parents about grief and how to help your teen through whatever grief they might be experiencing. And I think when you're talking about an adoptive family, somebody with an adoptee and as an adoptive parent, and I'm an adoptive parent. So learning those kind of hands-on tangible things to be able to take that, learn that, and use it with my children to help them overcome those things as we were talking about overcoming before and um so many things as just a, a normal person if it's not a an area of, of schooling or education that you've gone through yourself like grief counseling or grief recovery then you don't you're lost right you don't know where to go where to turn how to help your child get through whatever they might be going through and um, another workshop we had, there's a book and there's the author, I can't remember who she is, what, I mean, what her name is, but she's written a few different versions of it, how to talk to your kids so they'll listen and listen since your kid will talk. Um, but she has a little kid version and a teen version and I think another version, but we talked about that on one of our workshops and how um, how to talk since your teen, like so, so many times we might be busy, we're, we're trying to work or we're trying to deal with other, if we have multiple children, we're trying to deal with others of our children, right? And they don't always feel listened, especially the day and age now, like cell phones, right? We're constantly pulled in so many different directions that our, our kids, especially our teens, I feel, don't feel heard, don't feel like we care. And we're giving that, that wrong impression, that wrong example. And it's very innocent for the most part, usually, but, but learning those types of things or being reminded of those types of things in order to be the best parent we can be, um, especially if your child has gone through some sort of traumatic 
thing event in their past. Um, because I look at my six children, the three that were adopted and the three that weren't, and they've all gone through something, right? But, but it's all, and it, it's all their unique journey. And it's hard to help each one through that unique journey when I haven't personally been through most of it. So being able to talk to somebody else, listen to somebody else, have that own example in my life. Like I was talking that like the kids need in theirs, we need it too. So that's what I think answers your question. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. Um, I guess it, the, ess the essence of this, you talked about empathy. Mm. Um, uh, and you're talking about listening, uh, listening skills. Um, and the first thing that came into, sorry, can you, can you tell me the name of the book that you were talking about? Um, how to talk to kids that they will listen and listen okay. so kids will talk. So I will dig that out, how to talk to kids so they'll listen. And listen so they'll talk. And again, there's a little kid version and a teen version as okay. well. So I put a, so I'm putting some links into that uh, in in the show notes to the Amazon whatever um, Amazon page. Uh, this is about a, examples. You're talking about us having examples mm -hmm. so that we can understand what they uh, what they have gone through and focusing on in on them so that they are they feel heard um what because obviously i you know I, I hear a lot about kids on the phones mm. so i'm thinking as a you know as a if a parent's listening to say well the the, the kids want to be on their phones so how can I get through to them when they want to be on the phone? Like they don't know. Is that, am, am I making this, am, am making this up or no? No, it's very true. It, and it's hard. And I think it's a struggle. Um, maybe more so now than it ever has been because of the cell phones and the devices and the technology we have today than it was maybe in my childhood for my mom and dad. Um, but I think our instinct as a human is to be liked. So we want our kids to like us. So we feel like we need to be their friends, which isn't the case. And I see so many parents today trying to appease their kids and trying to be friends with their kids instead of being that role model and that um, and strict and firm and, and a parent, a, a parental role model instead of a friend, because they don't need friendship they need to be protected and directed and loved correctly and I, I think that putting the limits on the phone usage you don't want to because you want them to like you right but you have to because you're a parent yeah yeah so uh, have you got any um anything that you've learned around that from your own experience that 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 works because it sounds great but a lot of people you know well how you know how um, yeah definitely that's the... the how is always the most difficult part and i really think that having six different children they are very different unique personalities all of that like everyone is right um one thing works for one kid and it doesn't work for another so having to trial and error our way through it um has been the biggest learning curve really but um setting that age limit like if, if you aren't such and such age we did 15 um because they're starting to drive they're getting ready to be out on their own and they need that um life support just in case if something happens right um, and then for the younger ones, they have their other devices, like their iPads or their whatever, right. But they're, they're cut off Wi-Fi wise at a certain time at night. And my husband has our internet locked down so that they can't get on sites other than ones that are approved, things like that. Um, no phones at the dinner table rules that 
yes, it's a hard battle every time I have to remind them, put your phone away, or we're not doing this right now, or no, you cannot have more screen time. And they hate me in the moment, but I've talked to a lot of people I've met over the years with older kids and they've done similar things. And those older kids in the moment don't like it. I am so so sorry. (laughs) The kids don't like it in the, please get them. So well, this is real life. It is. Um, this is usually this what is what usually happens at my end, Sandy, because we've got two dogs too. Uh, and uh, as soon as I go to click on the recording button, uh, somebody comes from uh, uh, Amazon to deliver, you know, another important. Well, I I'm always breaking earphones. Earphone buds are always being broken. So, um, you know, it, it's an, it's another 20 quid, another $25 for, for a new set of earphones because I've broken the string on my earphones. Or I buy cheap ones. I buy cheap ones and they, um, and then they, you know, they work for two weeks and then they're not working. Yes. So this, 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 is, this is real life. We're talking about real life. It um, is so true. So flexibility flexibility um being firm and essentially you know that that parent rather than uh friend and Mm -hmm. persistence i guess persistence yes and consistency persistence yeah consist consistency Mm -hmm. and persistence and consistency um so uh what um the ex- the examples then that you're providing with the, your kids. I mean, what what's like whether it's with your kids or whether the kids on on, on rise up. What we're we're looking to provide talk you know talk about role models for our kids and stuff like that. What what does mm-hmm. that look like? Tell me more about that. And. So many times I think it's easy to, and I'm guilty of saying this too, um, listen to what I say, not what I do. Like I'll tell my kids, no, you can't have a cookie right now. And then I go and eat a cookie, right? Say I'm not being an example and they're watching. So I think being able to, consciously and you were mentioning the persistent you have to be persistent and the consistency on a consistent regular daily basis being that person that you want your kids to end up ultimately being to those those words that I used earlier the responsible independent strong empowered abstaining productive I have to ask myself what am I doing in my life that shows my children how to do these, these things, how to incorporate these characteristics into themselves and their lives. Um, Am I, am I doing what I preach or am I being a hypocrite? And it's so hard. It's so very hard on a regular basis, a daily basis, having to remind myself, no, this isn't the right path. I have to show them this path. And just the, the persistence and consistency is really just one thing that I constantly go back to. Yeah. So you're talking about self-awareness here, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what what helps you develop your own self-awareness? Having um, accountability is one thing. So for me, it's my husband and us being in sync and having that communication in order to and being um, open to criticism, like you shouldn't have done it that way. Maybe we should rethink how we just, what discipline we just gave and being able to reel it back in and change it and, and recognizing that I'm obviously not perfect. I'm human, right? And I make mistakes and making sure that I can go and apologize to my children if I've made that mistake and then make it right. Yeah. So the accountability. So one area, one area that fascinates me here um, that you're kind of alluding to, uh, which I pick up on, is the kind of the vulnerability. Mm. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, sharing tough times with our kids, uh, mm-hmm. 
sharing when we've made a mistake and all that sort of stuff. So what does that mean? What does that mean to you? I think I'm a big Brene, Brene Brown fan. I've really enjoyed watching some podcasts and reading some of her books. And she talks, of course, a lot about vulnerability and being brave in order to be vulnerable. And I think that if we're not vulnerable with our children and showing them that it's okay to, to not be perfect, to make mistakes, to then recognize it, realize it and work to fix it or correct it or to learn from it ultimately that we're not, we're not only doing ourselves an injustice, but our children or any other child or person in our lives that are watching us because they can, that's not an example for them because everybody is imperfect. Everybody makes mistakes. And if you show the children how to be vulnerable and learn and fail forward, then I feel like we are helping them acquire those characteristics that I keep mentioning because then they realize that I might not be productive as one of them or strong right now. And I've maybe failed working toward this point up until now, but I can keep working at it. I can keep striving to get there because it's been modeled for him. what what does that look like in terms of um the different the conversations you had with different kids so you've said obviously you've got got six you've got your hands full um does does vulnerability look you've talked about you know needing to adjust your approach with different kids Mm -hmm. What, what does vulnerability look like does vulnerability does your level of vulnerability look different to different kids and if so how and what does that mean I definitely think it does because I feel that one of my children for example she is very much like me I'm a silver lining um find whatever find the flowers in the rain or whatever type person and she is too so I don't have to show as much vulnerability or model failing forward as much with her because it's just instinctively in her. Um, another one of my children though, they, it's like a foreign concept to them. It's a, it's a, 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 an approach that they're having to learn that I'm having to very much model for them. So when they trip up, when they make a mistake, I might not have made the same mistake in my life, but if I can figure out or think back on something similar, Um, and relate to them, show that empathy, show that sympathy, and show that I was able to, to fail forward, to figure out, identify where I failed, and move forward past it, and use it as a stepping stone. So it definitely is different with each kid, the amounts, the amount of vulnerability that I I need to show to help them, the different, um, different parts of my vulnerability, of my past, of my future, of my fears, that I do share with each of them. Now they probably hear me talking to the other one. So I'm sure that they all hear my different approaches. Um, but it's definitely different with each one of them in particular. So it's all, all this stuff sounds quite logical and thought out, but at the same time, I'm thinking, surely like with six kids, this is, this is all pretty much intuitive in the moment made up mm. um, in, in the best possible way. Sandy. Yeah most definitely and I really attribute it to being open to being a lifelong learner um reading parenting books listening to things like I mentioned Brene Brown listening to audiobooks or podcasts trying to better myself as an individual as a parent and even as a wife to show them how you can be um and then having that in the back of my mind when things happen to bring out. Yeah. What's been the most, I mean, you mentioned Brene Brown a couple of times. Is she, is she been the most influential person for you in, on this, n- not on the vulnerability, but I, I, as a person, is, is there somebody else that's been more impactful that you would, that you would recommend listeners check out if they, if they kind of ring true to what you're saying, if, if yeah. what you're saying rings true to them. Sorry. She's been a big one for sure. Most recently, because it wasn't until about 
maybe a year or two ago that I stumbled upon her anyway. But um, people, I love leadership books too, because I really feel like people like um, John Maxwell and um, Og Mandino, they write in a story format that I really relate to, but that always has those hidden um, principles in them that help. And I think that I internalize them easier that way. So all those leadership books that are meant kind of more for business sometimes are really also just about life and being that influence and that empowerment and that person in the people's lives that that are in your life yeah um it's funny you should say that because i think the first book that i read uh, of any uh, you know any in, in this area uh, in this area of self-awareness was um Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of uh, yeah. People, probably about 20 years ago. And the one, the one that, uh, that was the second habit that stuck with me, uh, which was the seek, seek first to understand um, habit. So seek first, seek, seek first to understand. So, you know. That's awesome. Uh, keep your mouth shut and your ears open, that sort of stuff. Um, and the de- I listened to that again and again. Um, I think I bought, so I bought the book and then I bought the CD to listen to in the car because obviously this is before smartphones. And I listened to that CD all the time, but I didn't buy the rest of the habits because I didn't think they were as important to me to seek first to understand. So you recommended a book about listening so your your kids will talk. So that mm-hmm. that's, um, that's interesting, that leadership, that leadership piece here. Um, Interesting, interesting. So it seems that you're doing professionally, what you're doing professionally mirrors what you're doing personally because you are encouraging uh, teens to, uh, to, 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 to rise up. Do the, kids get in, do the kids get involved in, in, in the programs that you're doing or are they like a test bed for this or what does the... What does the relationship between those two parts of your life look like? Like my own kids yeah. and um, they are very active and rise up um, and the workshops and learning all of these techniques and life skills and different things that we offer. Um, so I think that's that which you were asking. Am I yeah. on the right track? Okay. Um, it's kind of twofold, probably more full than that. But it, when a, a teenager joins one of our workshops, if they happen to be, for whatever reason, the only teen on that night, they're going to feel awkward. If it's, it's like me and you and one teen, they're not going to be on, want to be on there. Right. So I have my four teenagers come on and then they see smiley, friendly teen faces. And so that is the ultimate reason. But then on the back end, they're getting this education that I can't provide for them myself because I don't have all the answers. So these other volunteers come in and pour into them. And so they're gaining that knowledge as well. Um, We also, some of those books that I've read or listened to, I'm a big audio person because I spend a lot of time in the car. So listening to those books, they're listening to too, or we hand them and we do a family book study um, sometimes during the summer. They hate it but they gain information from it as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big audio um, fan too, because I'm in the car a fair bit, but I'm also walking the dock along. And so <laughs> I can't a lot. So I can't, I can't believe, I can't really, you know, people say to me, like some people that have been on this podcast, you know, read my book. And I'm thinking, uh, yeah, have you got an audio version? <laughs> have you got an audio version? I'll be there. I'll do that. But Book. Right. Not at the moment. I don't really, you know, like by the time I've been talking all day on the podcast or listening all day to other people's podcasts and audio books, um, I I, I want to have I want to have my I want to eat and then I just want to watch out. Yeah. And, uh, watch some telly. Um. So yeah, I think audio. Obviously, you're listening to this on audio on the podcast listeners. So you're audio fans too. We're all in the same. <laughs> Um, I wanted to, uh, do you want to bring out something in terms of, 
uh, in terms of your kids. Do you ever put the Do you ever put the kids into a position where they're mentoring other kids? Yes, um, but so over the last ten years, I've homeschooled different combinations of my children. So we would always be in cooperatives or home study groups, and so. A lot of times my couple oldest children were usually the oldest ones in the group for whatever reason. And so they would always help the other kids. They would mentor them. They would um, tutor them. And that has really carried on through their lives because they really enjoy, especially one of my children in particular, he's amazing with younger kids and they look up to him almost like a magnet and he's so good with them. And so to be able to mentor them and whether it be sports, how to throw a football or, or tutoring them in math. So to, I really feel that may, I mean, maybe I'm tooting my own horn, but I feel like mine and my husband's modeling of mentoring and, and listening and being there for each other, I hope has rubbed off on them. And then they are doing it now, whether it be at school um, cause five of the six are in school this year. So they'll come home and talk about them helping their friends or their peers, um, somebody younger or whomever. And I really think that that them mentoring and showing that model is like a ripple effect. Right. And, and hopefully it will just continue. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're tooting your own horn. I love that. <laughs> um, so listeners, she is a leader. So she is encouraged. She is a CEO. Hi. Uh, so she is leading her nonprofit and she is leading her family. So I guess that's it, really. You know, um, I I would encourage, having worked with a lot of kids, um, I would encourage, well, I, um, I, I think it's really powerful when you flip places mm. with kids. And I'm talking about kids as young as eight or nine here, right? So I used to say to stuff, I used to say to them, I'd, you know, I'd try out a, um, I'd ask, ask them a question or I'd, or I'd uh, ask them, a, I'd, I'd, I'd make a statement and then I'd flip it round and, and rather than them expecting them to believe what I said, I'd say, do you want me to prove that? Uh, and they'd love that. They love that. So, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, do you want, do you want to share that with what, do you want to share that with what you've just learned? That's great. Do you want to share that with, you know, the group over there? Yeah, actually, don't ask them to believe what we say. Um, I'm not talking about whether brushing our teeth is good for us or, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but also asking them, ask rather than them being the student, make them the teacher. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, you talked about um, um, empowerment. Uh, your second, the second word that you said, you said productive and then empowered. Um, so empowering them is actually... Um, making them the leader before they're ready for it mm -hmm. or Putting them out of their get, comfort zone yeah get out of their comfort zone or getting them to try it on well sometimes they'll rush into that sometimes sometimes that yeah it just changing their seeing them as a, a co-leader as a fellow leader or as leader i'm or flipping it completely and making them the leader and us the student that kind of, they always the kids always seem to love that when I did that in 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 a in a class with them. They're like, that, oh wow, right, okay. That kind of that shaking stuff up because so yeah. much of their time. I mean, it'd be different for you with home homeschooling, but so much of conventional schooling, well, all conventional schooling, is. I say this a lot. I said it on a podcast I recorded earlier today. The kids have no control. They have no agency. Mm -hmm. they, the school has very little control as well. They, the mm -hmm. curriculum is set down. The lesson plans are worked out. They're 
scheme, well, the, the curriculum, then the what's it, scheme of work, and then and then they break that down into lesson plans. And yeah, the further it goes, the less control that they've, the, the, and, and the kids are just at that, at the behest of the, the teachers, and it creates sheep. Yeah. Not and I also, I also feel like it creates um, challenging behaviors in them too, because that's something they can control. So if there's nothing else in their life that they can control, sometimes they'll act out because that's what they can control to, and to get attention, obviously the wrong way, but to get that attention. Um, that you're right. I've had on my workshop two teenage presenters in the past couple months, and they absolutely loved having that opportunity to present on a topic that they were passionate about. And the teens that joined those workshops were very respectful and listened and asked questions. Um, so I think that definitely changing it up, putting them out of their routine, letting them learn from somebody else, especially when it's a peer and they have a positive, good, good thing to share. I think it's very important. Okay. So what's the question I haven't asked? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure you've asked a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I, I want to go back to the, I want to go back to this kind of this um, uh, rationalization thing. So I was saying that it seems to me that, you know, you're presenting this after the, after the fact, as a lawyer would say, I'm not a lawyer, by the way, uh, but <laughs> after the fact, you're presenting this quite rationally and you shut it down, but it seemed to me with six kids being the CEO of a nonprofit, doing all this stuff is it is it more intuitive in is it more intuitive in the in in the moment and the and the stuff is rationalized afterwards what does that does that make any yes um so it, i definitely think a lot of it is intuitive and a lot of it is in the moment learning from showing I, I talked a lot about failing forward and i think i failed a lot and I think that I took those as opportunities over the years when my kids were younger to go, to think back, that was not the right way to handle that situation. What would have been a better way? And kind of what I would do with my kids, like they make a mistake, right? Okay, we well, messed up with this. What would have been a better way to handle that? So treating myself the same way because I needed to be retrospective as well with myself and not just the kids, just because showing them that just because I'm an adult, doesn't mean I have all the answers and doesn't mean I don't mess up. So messing up in the moment a lot and still do. But like I said earlier, having that vulnerability and backtracking and being able to show them, I didn't mean to do that that way. I was angry. I handled that incorrectly. I'm sorry. And going forward and trying to remember that the next time that situation comes up so that I handle it more appropriately. Yeah. Does that yeah, it does. Yeah, I I think that's great. I mean, that is the the role, you know, like the role model, like um, yeah, fail, failing failing forward. I I love this uh, feed forward rather than feedback. Don't don't yeah. tell me what I did wrong. Tell me what I should do better next time. Right. Um. Uh. You know that whole thing. I and I I catch myself also tell people what you want rather than what you don't want. And and I heard that twenty years ago. But I still find myself um, uh, correcting emails and, and messaging. So, so I use a lot of uh, freelancers to do research and bits and pieces work work for me. And I sometimes get, I often get halfway through some some feed forward, but I'm realizing that I'm actually giving them feedback. So I'm telling uh -huh. them what's wrong with their work rather than what I write what I write and I, and I don't know whether I catch it every single time but I actually I catch it in the moment right I catch it in the moment much my, my I know that this is a, a weakness a common failure uh, you know uh, and I also know 
because I'm doing I'm doing this stuff electronically, so I'm doing it on emails and stuff. So mm-hmm. I I also know that telling them how I want to tell them how I feel, right? But I know that they couldn't give right. stuff right. about how I feel. They just they just want the facts. Like right. I feel that I should vent. Um, so somebody did this work for me, and it it's like. 90% complete, 10% incomplete. So I sent an email back saying, can you complete? I, I, I wrote out an answer one way. And then I looked at it and I thought, no, that's wrong. So I typed it and I said, no, just please, please, please complete the missing file. And they sent back saying, well, how much are you going to pay me? How much are you going to pay me um, for, uh, for, for completing the task? Well, I asked the task to be complete at the outset, you know, and I, I, I could have put nothing, right. do your job, you know, or nothing you've agreed to. And instead, I just said, um, please complete the task for the agreed budget. And then, but I, I caught my um, emotional reaction right. kind of halfway through typing the stuff out. Um, and I'm wondering if if you can if you can think of a parent a parent because that's clearly that's not a parenting story it's a business story really but does that stack does that does that translate to yeah a hundred percent and so much easier to be able to delete an email than to have said something and then because you can't I use the example with my kids before when they were little things that you say that are hurtful, you can't take back and you show them toothpaste and you squirt some toothpaste out and you can't put that back in the tube, right? It, it's it's out there. So what you say is all out there forever. You can apologize, but you can't take the words back. So being in the moment, for example, I have gotten a lot more patient or have learned to be more patient over the years, but I would lose my um, cool quicker when they were younger and I would yell, give a discipline or a punishment, then calm down and rethink, oh, that isn't an appropriate punishment. Um, I shouldn't have yelled like that. It was an accident on their part or, or whatever it was. And then having to go back. I'm sorry that I lost my cool. That punishment's off the table let me calm down some more and I will let you know what your consequence for your actions are. Um, and, and it'd be a more reasonable consequence instead of like, you've lost TV for a month. <laughs> like That's not, that's not realistic to be able to do. Right. So yeah. in in the moment having to, and even sometimes when it clicks while I'm doing it, some it's hard to then step back. Because it, like you said, the emotional response still has you triggered, still has you upset or whatever the emotional response is and taking that back seat in the moment is hard. But with trial and error, I have learned more often than that to walk out of the room. My husband, ever since we got married, has always done that. We would maybe get in an argument over something little he would walk off to cool off. That would anger me. Cause I'm like, where are you going? We need to talk about this. Right. And he needed his space to cool off. And now that I'm older and we have four teenagers, I realize that that's the best way not to say something that you can't put back in that toothpaste tube. So to walk off, calm down and then come back to the situation level headed is probably the best thing I've learned over the years. And um, did you, because to, to me, that's, um, if, if I could sum that up in two words, it's emotional intelligence. Oh, yeah. Have that's you, true. Yeah. Have, have, you, um, have you done, you, you say you're a lifelong um, learner. Have, have, you, have you read any, is it Daniel Goldman? Is he the emotional intelligence guy? He's kind of. Yeah, of yeah, you're right. I would not have remembered that name. You're spot on. Um, I have read some of his stuff. Yeah. Some of that stuff. Uh, are there any uh, particular did was did that emotional intelligence stuff did that land for you was that was that big was that big for you do you think it it did it was helpful um i think the 
The biggest things that have been helpful for me, though, are more on the since my three children are adopted from foster care, um, they've had tr- gone through the traumatic events and that trauma on the brain research and how to handle um, children that have had traumatic events in their past, like with TBRI and stuff. That I feel has been the biggest impact player in our lives, even though only three of our six are adopted, those techniques and that research and knowledge that I've learned through that um, studying has really helped with all six of our children more than anything else I've done or read or studied. Yeah, yeah. So is there a particular, you mentioned TBRI, um, mm-hmm. is there a particular book um, or anything, a podcast Uh, or or video whatever training that you recommend from that yes dr perry and his last name just slipped my mind but if you like google or on youtube search him dr perry is amazing yes bruce perry Um, yep and karen purvis yeah and dr dan siegel seagal um those three um, last year, I would watch their YouTube videos and listen to their books on audio quite a bit. And it was very impactful. Yeah. Um, what? Because I listened to one of, I listened to a, a Karen Purvis book. And maybe I just, maybe it's because I just haven't been through the lived experience that you had it didn't really it didn't hit me like a lot of it didn't hit me like the emotional intelligence stuff did it didn't hit me like um some of the other stuff that i've read like um my the one that really hit me was uh power versus force have you come out? david hawkins Mm-mm, i haven't read that one it's got a scale of human consciousness. Um, uh, I'm going to just, uh, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm working on a little bit at the moment. And I, I'd, I'd love your take on this because I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm yet able to suss it, um, uh, to, to sum it up very briefly and to the point. So would it be okay if I just play with this? Sure. So my my consciousness, my level of self-awareness, my mood, all those things have been up and down a lot in my life. Mm -hmm. And yet we have a historical event, me being adopted 54 years ago. So that's a fixed event. My mood is a variable, has been a variable thing over the 54 years. Right. So how can a variable experience be due to one fixed event? The first thing that comes to mind is, it, I kind of relate it to grief a little bit and how there are stages of grief and that there are triggers that make us remember things um, at certain times that maybe we had forgotten or we haven't thought of, or we thought we had resolved within ourselves. And I think that it's just a, just from my personal reflection, thinking out loud with you, I I feel that it's just whatever, whatever that fixed event in our life is, it gets, it creeps up in our lives regularly no matter how much work we might've done to, to work through it, to overcome it, to understand it. I think that it's always, there's still a part of us subconscious or, or not that it's going to still affect us on some level. When those triggers are introduced in our lives, whatever those might be, then our emotions, our moods are going to be fluctuate with that trigger. And when it comes and when it goes, it is what I, what first comes to mind for me when you say that. Okay. So the way I see it is that it's my thinking in the moment. That's how I feel. Yeah. It's my thinking at the moment. And 
and and and if 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 that's the case, then I should be vigilant of my thoughts. Well, I've tried that, right. <laughs> and that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so the way I kind of see it at the moment is that um, taking my thoughts a little less seriously. It's hard. It is very hard. And I've listened to um, people. I have some anxiety, but I don't have anything compared to what others um, suffer with or have to deal with on a regular basis. And I really feel like it kind of goes hand in hand with that, where your emotions and your thoughts control everything. And people with severe anxiety have to learn those coping mechanisms, right? And and learning how to control their wow. thoughts and triggers. Well, yeah, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. You're um, fine. Or, or maybe not. <gasps> this is the thing, right? So at, at, at the essence, the essence of my take on this is that um, we're kind of like, we're too invested in our thoughts. That's true. Because they're your thoughts, right? Well, are they though? I mean, this is uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. so. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend a podcast. In, in, uh, I'm gonna recommend a podcast um, on anxiety, actually, uh, to, to to the listeners and maybe yourself if you want to take a look at it. Called uh, a little a little peace of mind. A little peace of mind, and it's spelled as in not a peace of mind, as in peace as in part but peace as in the opposite of war peace gotcha. of mind, a little peace of mind awesome. so I, I will put that in the um the show notes um it's uh she's she's a gifted she's a gifted coach and and she's coming from a place that influences a lot of work that i do is that we're actually too invested in our too invested in our thoughts we're too we're trying to change our thoughts we live in this world which is you know change our thoughts change mm -hmm. our life well i've tried changing thoughts i I've, 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 I've kids find it very easy to change their thoughts given because that that's what i did with 1600 kids got to change their right. thoughts. um but adults we find it kind of difficult so you know we've we, i've tried that reframing or that nlp stuff if you've done any nlp stuff mm -mm. Uh, so that's really tough so my my take on this is uh, uh, you know what's worked for me has been taking my thoughts less seriously rather than trying to change them. so mm -hmm. i've always tried to change the voice in our head right reframe it think of more positive Whereas, yeah, I, I could never do that. But what I do find it easier to do is to ignore the voice in my head rather than try and change mm -hmm. it. That makes sense. Just as hard as changing. And I think maybe just as invested too, no? Sorry? Because you, you mentioned we're so invested we're invested in our own thoughts so ch by trying to change them but ignoring them would be just as invested in them right because you're actively pushing them out yeah i think i get what you mean um we've all got this voice in our head that says right. we're not good enough. Absolutely. And by taking that voice on, taking taking that voice on prolongs the battle when all we want is peace. That makes sense. It's true. So the idea I, I, uh, on this, um, I. I I started this, I had this idea about three months ago. And the idea was that 
uh, the idea that there are such a thing as limiting beliefs is actually a limiting belief. Can you say that one more time? The idea that there are such a thing, there are such a thing as limiting beliefs is in fact a limiting belief. Because hmm. we're reinforcing good. it. Oh, I've got this limiting belief. Oh, you know, like, so public speaking would be a great one, right? Uh -huh. No, I've got this phobia of, you know, I've got this phobia. We, what, what we focus on gets, gets bigger. Right. So I, I, I told this, I, 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 I talk about my own story. Uh, my, uh, your kids were adopted from foster care. So they'd had some, they'd gone through some tough stuff. Right. I was adopted at five weeks old. I didn't go through any tough stuff other than the relinquishment trauma, if you can right. that right now. So this is just my experience. At 40, I, I, I started making a trauma ball, right? Like a snowball. You know, you talk about this a lot on the show. You make, mm -hmm. um, apologies listeners, if you heard me this before, but uh, Sandy hasn't heard this. So it's making, it's like we make a snowball, you scoop up some snow, you put it between your, palms you roll it and, and you roll it into like an egg size bit mm -hmm. an egg size um ball and then you roll it along the ground and you and you make it and, 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 and like you're making the base of a snow person right that's kind of what i did un, 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 unwittingly innocently right. um and then and so so what did i do then i started learning stuff and I brought like a industrial heater to the trauma that I had inadvertently um, created. It melted away. It became a pool of water. And then that melted away because there was nothing there in the first place. Right. It was just thought. I like that. That's an awesome way to think about it and to frame it and to overcome it. Yeah. But you overcome it by realizing there was nothing there. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's definitely different for everyone because there was, I think, something truly there because that abandonment is huge. And that feeling of not knowing and um, learning how to get, to wrap your mind around it, to be able to then melt your snowball. Yeah, but most of my not being good enough actually comes from business rather than adoption. Oh. I didn't think I, I was good enough. And you're right. We all have that voice. We all have that. Um, what do they call it? Imposter syndrome, where we don't feel yeah, like we're good enough. We make it. We 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 exactly. it. Oh, I've uh -huh. got imposter syndrome. Oh my God, I've got imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, what am I going to do about my imposter syndrome? I can't possibly. I can't possibly. A hundred percent. You know, and you it's know within that, our control. It, but but do you know that like that DSM thing, this manual that the the uh, psychiatrists use, it, it used to have, mm -hmm. it used to be like, a, I, I'm, I I don't know the exact thing, it, I, I don't know the exact, exact thing, but what I'm led to believe is it's the latest version of this document is four times bigger than the original one, something like that. So that makes sense. We're we put we're making these we're taking these yeah would you like to i'm conscious of time would uh, have you got any final thoughts i feel like i've been talking too much for the last 10 minutes <laughs> you're fine i'm i i feel like myself and and your listeners are going to gain a lot and i have gained a lot from listening to you so i appreciate you sharing i really can't think of anything else cool. that I want to share, or say, except for thank you so much for having thank me you. on. And thank you, Sandy. And we'll put links, obviously, in the show notes. Um, so if you're listening, uh, still listening at this point, and you want to find out more about Sandy, 
and I would urge you to to do that. Check out what she's doing at uh, Rise Up. Um, check out the links uh, in the show notes, and we'll see you all again soon, listeners. Thanks for listening, and thank you for sharing. Sandy. You've been a star. <laughs>